Well, today's sermon on this Father's Day is Father, Forge the Future. Father, Forge the Future. We're going to be turning to Luke chapter 6, verses 12 through 16. We'll return to this passage for the next couple Sundays, so you'll get to know this passage pretty well. Today we're also going to be reading initially from Luke chapter 22, verses 25 through 30. This is part of Jesus' Last Supper discourse with his disciples, his inner group of disciples, and specifically, very directly, with his apostles. We'll also incorporate into the sermon today Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. I invite you to hear now God's word. Now, it came to pass in those days, he, this is Jesus, went out to the mountain to pray. And he spent the night in prayer with God. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them twelve, whom he also called, named the apostles. Simon, whom he named Peter, and Andrew his brother and James and John, and Philip and Bartholomew, and Matthew and Thomas, and James of Alphaeus, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was called the Zealot, and Judas of James, that is, son of James, and Judas Iscariot, Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. And then to Chapter 22, picking up at verse 25. And he said to them, Jesus is speaking to his inner group, to the apostles. If we pair Luke with the information that we have from John's gospel, Judas is out of the room at this point. So we're talking about the the 11 of the 12, actually. He said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them. And those in authority over them are called benefactors. But not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest, and the leader as one who serves. For who is the greater, the one who reclines at table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at table? But I am among you as the one who serves. And you are those who have stayed with me in my trials. And I bestow to you, as my Father bestowed to me, a kingdom, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. Father, forge the future. What legacy are you leaving? Are you faithfully forging the future? As I've already mentioned, this is a message specifically, certainly to fathers who have children and grandchildren under their leadership, spiritual leadership, but to every disciple as well in the household of faith, men and women, girls and boys. I knew as I began last week that I was going to be preaching this direction of a sermon for, of course, Father's Day. And I was preparing to ask each one of you, and most directly fathers, are you faithfully forging the future? You know, we're only here for a little while. The future stretches out in front of us, and we we'll only have a small bit of the future, even for those of us who are gonna live a a few more decades. Are you faithfully forging the future? And then, as I began last week, two points of reference came uh, to me, and I'm gonna address them today in reverse order. Uh, I'm gonna begin with Tuesday night when Derek Metz called me with the the news that suddenly, um, and, and painfully, tragically, his sister, Delisa, had died, and uh, so we were talking about her death and praying about her 
family, and then also talking about a service, that a memorial service that I was able to lead on Thursday night in Louisville. Uh, when we were talking and praying, Derek pretty promptly asked me uh, about and brought up the dash, which Derek remembered uh, Gene Stallings, Coach Gene Stallings, reading at a memorial tribute to Jimmy Rain's father, Tony Rain. While Derek was speaking to me, I remembered back to Bob Dole's uh, national funeral service that was held at the National Cathedral, and a woman, and it turned out to be, I found out her name, Sheila Burke, who worked with Bob Dole for about 20 years, uh, included the dash in that service and, and noted that Senator Dole often read this poem when he gave speeches, particularly in the latter part of his career and life and also at a number of eulogies and memorial services. So here's the poem, in case you don't know it, The Dash by Linda Ellis. I read of a man who stood to speak at the funeral of a friend. He referred to the dates on the tombstone from the beginning to the end. He noted first came the date of birth and spoke of the following date, in other words, the death date, with tears. But he said what mattered most of all was the dash between the years. For that dash represents all the time that they spent on earth. And now only those who love them know what that little line is worth. For it matters not how much we own, the cars, the house, the cash. What matters is how we live and love and how we spend our dash. So think about this long and hard. Are there things you'd like to change? For you never know how much time is left that can still be rearranged. If we could just slow down enough to consider what's true and real and always try to understand the way other people feel. Be less quick to anger and show appreciation more and love the people in our lives like we've never loved before. If we treat each other with respect and more often wear a smile, remember that this special dash might only last a little while. So when your eulogy is being read with your life's actions to rehash, would you be proud of the things they say about how you spent your dash? So if you're following along with the sermon notes, which I hope you are, if you're online, you can pull these up. We've got the bulletin posted with the sermon notes. I pretty much hope you can fill in the blank here. What matters most is how you spend your what? Dash. Now, that's a very moving point of reference that Derek brought to my mind on Tuesday night. Another one was a little more jarring, but very important to read. On, on Monday morning, I read an article that was posted actually Sunday night on the Wall Street Journal um, of one particular father passing on his legacy and the leadership of his family heritage to one of his sons. The Wall Street Journal carried an article about multi-billionaire George Soros, who for the past 50 years has been one of the richest and arguably has been the most influential social prog progressive power player and political donor in the world, not only in the United States, but in Europe, in Africa, in the Middle East, massively influencing politics and judicial appointments in the United States and throughout the world, um, of ethnic Jewish heritage, George Soros, along with his parents, is a survivor of the 1940s version of the Holocaust in Hungary. He was a little boy at the time. George Soros has stated throughout his adult life that he is, in his own words, irreligious and does not believe in God. He's not only been a masterful investor and a powerful political activist, but also a prolific author, which most of you will know. Some of you have probably a number of his books. These include The Bubble of American Supremacy, The Crisis of Global Capitalism, Open Society Endangered, 
and of course, the age of, of fallibility, in which Soros clearly and boldly states, the main obstacle to a stable and just world order is the United States of America. The main obstacle to a stable and just world order is the United States of America. Well now, George, 92 years old, has passed on his legacy and the leadership of his empire uh, to his 37-year-old son, Alex Soros. To some observers, the choice of Alex was a little bit surprising. You know, if you remember the Soros family, Alex is the fourth in the line of children of George Soros. He's the elder son by Soros' second wife, um, Susan, whom Soros divorced uh, in order to marry his third wife, uh, Annalise. But, but before that, of course, uh, he, he was married earlier uh, and had three children. And there's two sons and one daughter who've been very active, very influential folks. But George Soros chose Alex, his first child by his second wife. Now, Alex is young and very healthy, educated in the US, NYU, and then PhD in philosophy and social uh, influence from University of California, Berkeley. He's, he's more actively engaged in politics, much more than his older siblings. And he wants to reform and change the world much more than it presently is. After succeeding his father in December as the new head of the Open Society Foundations Network, he then succeeded his father early this year uh, to run George Soros's political action committee. And now, this past week, he's been named to lead Soros's uh, primary $25 billion financial empire. In the Wall Street Journal article that opened this week, Alex affirms that he is more political and more progressive than his father. He's 37 years old, he's in very good health, and he looks forward to influencing the 21st century much more than his dad has in the world in which you, your children, and your grandchildren will live. So that's Alex Soros, that's, that, and that's his plan. So let me ask you this, what's your plan? What's your plan? And of course, ultimately, most important, what is God's plan? Well, let's talk about that. Father, forge the future. Again, I'm asking each of you here, if you're a Christian disciple, and most definitely, if you are a father or may become a father in the future, what legacy are you planning to leave? Actively planning to leave. Uh, as a member of Christ's church, how are you impacting the world for God's kingdom to younger generations? Are you faithfully forging the future? In today's wind, here's a question. What are you? What are you? Let's, I've got a blank for you there. What are you? Uh, James, the book of James, the New Testament, talks about us being a vapor in the wind. And we're definitely dealing with a lot of winds nowadays in the 21st century. So what are you? Are you just kind of a vapor that's going to pass through and be gone without leaving an impact on the future for God's kingdom? What are you? Uh, are you a vapor or a faith-anchored forger of the future? Let me ask you this, how are you investing? And I do mean that sometimes literally, investing what God has given you financially, but also investing yourself, your interest, and your time. Are you basically a consumer? Are you someone who serves the kingdom? What am I, I hope you like this one, what am I, there's a blank there before I pass on. What am I, you should be able to fill this one in. What am I passing on before I pass on? I mean, what are my children, my grandchildren, and other people under my influence in the church and in the larger community learning from me, being equipped from me? Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, speaking to fathers specifically, this is a command from God's word. Fathers, do not exasperate your children, 
Do not provoke them to anger. Do not exasperate your children. That's a negative command. Now the positive. But do bring them up in the Lord's training and admonition. In the Lord's training and admonition. Nurture them in the Lord's training and admonition. Bring them to maturity in the Lord's training and admonition. And today what we're looking at we're pausing and looking at this aspect of what is happening in Jesus' ministry that we read about as we come to Luke chapter 6, verses 12 through 16. Jesus is under attack already by the scribes and the Pharisees. He's still principally operating up in Galilee, although he, he is sometimes down into Judah, certainly sometimes to Jerusalem. At this point in his ministry, he, he's, been, he's been at public ministry for a number of months, and we see increasingly, Luke makes this clear, Matthew, Mark also make this clear, that there's a rising opposition to Jesus by the religious leaders, including the scribes or teachers of the law, and by the larger religious conservative group called the Pharisees. What is Jesus going to do? Jesus knows that he has come to the world to die in your place, in my place. And he can see already that it's coming to uh, an imminence now. He's going to die. So what does he do? Go into deep depression and go into a cave and just kind of wait for it? Does he uh, just kind of entertain himself? There were some great theater and great shows at some of the Decapolis cities. He could have entertained himself. Kind of his version of, in those days, our version of just watching some Netflix and some other entertainment. Is that what he does? No. King Jesus, the father of all New Covenant, New Testament believers, in other words, by extension, his children, forges a future for the new Israel and for the church that he is bringing about. That's what he does. So we look to him as our model. As he looks at his passing on, what does he do? He passes on and develops a renewed Israel. And, and this is very clear because he calls 12 apostles. That's not by accident. How many tribes of Israel are there? 12. And speaking of a time dimension, how many months are there? 12. So Jesus is saying, into time and for all time and into the ministry, I am calling forth a new Israel, a renewed Israel, under this apostolic leadership, and I have a plan, and I'm going to forge it before they kill me, before they crucify me. That's what's happening here in chapter 6, verses 12 through 16. But first, let's go back for a moment, look at major prophecies about Jesus, about his coming 700-plus years before he came from Isaiah. From the fourth servant song, the suffering servant song, Isaiah chapter 53 from the second part of verse 10, this is the final stanza. This is after he's been pierced for our transgressions. He's died for our sin. Notice this. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. Do you see that? But wait a minute. He never married. He never had biological children. By the way, for those of you who are not biological or adoptive fathers, just remember this. He, he never married. He never had biological children. And he's dead. He's died for our sin. But wait a minute. He somehow is going to see, see his offspring. This, of course, is a prophecy, part of this fifth stanza prophecy of the resurrection of Jesus. And everyone who is a believer in Jesus is not only a son of or a child of Abraham, but also an offspring, a child of Jesus. That's what that's telling you. Okay? Uh, he shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper his hand. Now we're going to go back in Isaiah. Chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, a prophecy that we often read during Advent and Christmas time. Uh, this incredible prophecy about a child, a child who is born to us. And the term there in Hebrew, yelled, is for a male child. So we already know it's a male child. The second term, ben, for son means like a royal son in the line of David. So unto us a child, a male child is born, unto us a son is given. We're clearly not talking about in the context of this prophecy just another son 
in the royal line of David. We are clearly talking about somebody who's going to change the world, who's going to bring light in the midst of darkness, and who is going to establish a kingdom that has no end and is ever increasing. We're talking about the divinely given Messiah. This is a messianic prophecy. So uh, that's who we're talking about. He's going to restore and renew Israel, which is exactly what Jesus is in the process of doing and planning to do in Luke chapter 6 that we read about. The government, Isaiah says, the kingdom will be on his shoulder. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. It's never going to stop. It's eternal. With justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, whoever this is, this son who is given to us. Now let's look at the throne names. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6. The throne names of this child born to us, the son given to us, include, you remember, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. Okay, I'm going to highlight two of these, the first and the third. Wonderful planner. Pela Yoats. The word there is probably better for us translated as planner. When, when the Bible is talking about counsel and counselor in this case, the Bible is talking about not a therapist who sits down and says, tell me about your relationship with your parents and your, your, your problems. This, this is what this is talking about. This is not that kind of counselor. This is a counselor who plans and guides you into the future. Isaiah repeatedly talks about the Lord's etza, the Lord's plan the Lord's plans, which will come to fulfillment. And now this is telling you this baby, this child born to you, operates the same way. He makes plans and he executes them. In theology, we call this providence, the providence of God. So wonderful planner. And notice this is always jarring to Christians, everlasting father. Wait a minute, I thought the first person of the Trinity is the father. Yes, but the second person is also in a sense, reflective of the first person of the Trinity, our father in the faith. And he is head of the household of the church. Our one true head is Jesus Christ. He is the spiritual father. So he's the wonderful planner. He's the everlasting father. Hans Wielberger, in his uh, commentary on Isaiah, says this. The messianic king does not dispense just any counsel, but is a ruler who, like the Lord, like Yahweh, plans wonderful, astonishing things and naturally is in a position to carry these things out. This Messiah is not only the Messiah, he's also divine in his counsel and in his providence, which brings us back to Jesus. This is who this is. This is what this is prophesying about Jesus and his ministry. He is a wonderful planner, and he's our everlasting father. In the face of rising opposition from religious leaders, knowing he is called to die for you and for me, knowing he's called to die to redeem Israel and establish the new Israel, he forges the future for his kingdom and his kingdom's children. That means for us, for you and me. So, Luke. Chapter 6, verses 12 through 16. For the, can you fill in the blank, for the future, for the future, notice this, Jesus says three things. Let's learn from this, three things. Jesus prays. In fact, he spends all night praying, Luke tells us. This is a hapex legomena. It's the only time this, this word is used, and it's used in the imperfect participial. It, it goes on all night. Jesus is all night up on the mountain praying in communion with the Father for the future. What am I supposed to pray about? Well, the big thing you're supposed to pray about is the future. Jesus prays for the future before he chooses. Secondly, of course, yes, he does. He chooses under his Father's guidance and counsel from among the family of disciples, 12 leaders, whom he also names or calls apostles those who will be sent out from him. And for the future, number three, Jesus prepares them all, not just the apostles, but every single disciple, every man and every woman who's following him. 
He prepares them all. Jesus forges the future. So we can all say, that's awesome, and I love Jesus. I'm not divine. I know you're not. I know I'm not. For sure I know I'm not. But what are we called to do? As followers of Jesus, we are to believe and submit to Jesus and in him, in his Holy Spirit, by his power, forge the future. Dads, are you listening? Disciples, are you listening? In Jesus and in the power of his wonderful planning and his everlasting fatherhood and his kingdom that will last forever, forge the future. And know that you will be part of the victory in Jesus. So number one, pray. Dads, how's your prayer life? How are you praying for the future right now? For your family's future? You're not going to be here forever. What is God teaching you and telling you about the future? Are you spending time, serious time with him? I want to invite you to do that. Pray, number one. Number two, choose. Now, this gets very complicated. I mean, in my flesh, I don't know how to choose. I need definitely to be submitted to Jesus and seeking the guidance of the Holy Spirit, but there need to be assignments for the future. Jesus clearly, notice this, in choosing 12 to be his apostles, he's choosing the rest of the disciples for different roles under the leadership of the apostles. What's your plan for your family? Who's doing what in the future? Who's doing what in the church for the future? We're supposed to be praying about that and proactively engaged under God's guidance in that story. So pray, choose, and prepare. Prepare them. Prepare them. You're not going to be here forever. And even right now, they need to be maturing and growing up. So as we see on the night of the Last Supper, Jesus continues to forge the future with his apostles. Again, as I would read John and Luke together, uh, Judas is gone at this point, but he's speaking, more broadly speaking, uh, to the apostles. And he says, I bestow to you, that's the language, the language there is really more like bequeathing, giving. I bestow to you, to the apostles, as notice this, as who bestowed to me? As the Father bestowed to me, now I bestow to you. What you have received also pass on. As the Father bestowed to me a kingdom so that you, the apostolic leaders, may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. There it is. That's the link back to this whole story, what Jesus is doing. Now let's go to us. Ephesians 6, chapter 4. Dads, bring them up. Nurture them. The, the word there in the Greek, the ektrepho, means like nurture to maturity. Nurture up to maturity. In the Lord's training, paideia, and admonition. Now, practical application. J. Warner Wallace, Jim Wallace, great apologist for the last couple decades, prolific leader, author, teacher, tells us stop teaching them and start training them. He's talking to the church and he's talking to parents. Stop teaching them and start training them. I asked Boston Hampton, who was here at the early service, I said, Boston, if I got up and gave a little talk for 15 minutes and showed some pictures of soccer, would a child be ready to play soccer? He said, no, you have to train the child to play soccer. Right? If, if, if I'm going to just talk about the faith and maybe sharing the faith, but I never have my children or anybody under my spiritual leadership engaged in sharing the faith and being able to understand the faith and being able to understand and actually discuss the Bible with somebody else, they're never gonna be able to do it. If all we're doing is consuming and never producing, we will remain stagnant as simple consumers. So stop teaching them and start training them. Dads with your children, dads with your grandchildren, Stop teaching them and start training them. It, 
Jim Wallace talks about this most recently in his book, Forensic Faith, and also the one he co-wrote with Sean McDowell in 2019, so the next generation will know. Here it is. Here's the uh, acronym, TRAIN. TRAIN. Number one, test them today and test them regularly. If you, don't, if you know that I'm going to test you on this sermon, you walk into the service and I'm going to give you a test afterwards, I guarantee you, you will learn more. If I said, okay, at the end of the service, we're going to hand out um, a test and then we're going to post the results up on these screens, I guarantee you, you'd be paying a, a lot of attention, right? Test them. What do you know? What do you don't know? Test them. Dads, test your children. What do you actually know? What do you know? And not just with head knowledge, but with can you do this? Show me how you do it. How do you do it? Show me. How are you going to do it? If I'm not here, how do you do it? Require more. R, require more. We expect a lot of our children in AP classes in high school. We expect a lot of our children to do all kinds of things. But then some, for some reason, a lot of people with faith, well, all you need to know, honey, is God loves you. Like, you got to be kidding. They're taking AP classes, and that's all you think they need to know about the most important thing in all history, in all eternity? You know, require more. Um, A, arm them spiritually in the truth of God's word, wisdom, and discernment. They need to be armed. They need to know. You need to help them. And again, you can't just spout it out to them. They need to be able to show you. Well, where did I find that? If somebody says this, how do I know that? What do you believe about that? Tell me how you would talk with a friend who doesn't believe this or that, or who thinks God is okay with this or that. What's going on in your discussions in your household? Arm them spiritually with the truth of God's word, wisdom, and discernment. I, and, and Wallace really emphasizes this, involve them. Involve them in today's challenges, preparing them to face tomorrow's challenges. That's, that's my elaboration on his I. Let them help you deal with today's challenges because in some of tomorrow's challenges, you're not going to be there with them. Even if you're still living, when they come to maturity, they're not going to be by your side. You're not going to be driving them everywhere the rest of their lives. I hope not. Okay? They're going to be independent. So involve them today. And Wallace says a key thing to this and really to all these pieces is schedule it. Put it in your calendar and on their calendar. Because if they know, back to the test, test them, if they know in a few weeks we are going somewhere and we're going to be engaged with people who don't believe or we're going to help people with a mission project, they're going to be a lot more focused if they're actually, this is part of what we do with youth ministry, Maddie. You know, it's like we've got to get them out doing things. Uh, what Wallace does, remember he's an apologist. He works with middle schoolers and high schoolers in many formats, and he tells them, okay, guys, in eight weeks, he, he's in California, he's in Southern California, in eight weeks, we're going to the campus of Cal Berkeley, University of California, Berkeley, which, by the way, is where Alex Soros graduated with his PhD. Okay. Uh, and we're going to have, you're going to go and talk about life questions and issues with students and graduate students on campus. And he says, you wouldn't believe how much more the middle schoolers and high schoolers, they get a little nervous about this, but how much more it's real for them when they know in eight weeks we're going to Berkeley. And, and then the next trip is, that's kind of more for philosophical and current cultural type issues from a faith perspective. For more precise issues with biblical theology, uh, the next road trip that he tells them he's going to take them on is they're going to go to Provo, Utah, to the BYU campus, and to Salt Lake City to around the tabernacle and talk with Mormons about their faith and our faith. Very different versions of who Jesus is and what a Christian faith is. If they know that's happening in two months, they're going to be learning a lot more. But then, of course, when you engage and involve children, youth, and even adults, finally they need to be nurtured because life has its hurts and hardships. If you have preteens and teens, you know they need a lot of nurture. They don't need just your hard head. <laughs> they need a soft and loving heart, too. They need nurture. And, um, you know, if you take a teenager who gets blown out of his mind 
uh, by some discussions with some folks at Cal Berkeley, you better be circling back up with him on the bus ride back and in the coming days. I never thought of that. When that person said that, I had no answer. Yeah, and go back through the training with a nurturing heart. Statistically, far more young people depart the faith because they've grown up in families and in churches where they cannot express any doubts or ask any questions. This is statistically borne out now over the last 30, 40 years. A huge majority of people who grew up in the church but leave it when they get to college or become young adults, part of the reason is because they never were able to actually talk and be trained in faith and ask questions and say, why do we believe that? What's going on with that? Because somebody else said this. So train. Don't just teach. Don't just spout out five minutes of, you know, your great wisdom. Train them. Engage with them. Dads, train them. Do not send a boy to face a 95-mile-an-hour fastball if you've never actually had him bat on the tee. <laughs> I mean, if all you've done is talk to him about the concept of baseball, you probably don't want to throw him out at a Mississippi State game, much less a major league game, right? Train them up. Nurture them up in the way of faith. Fathers, forge the future. The world has its plans, but we serve and believe in the one whose plan will prevail. Wonderful planner, mighty God, everlasting Father. Turn to him. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org slash connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org slash give to give.